Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric, and uh, despite what must be, I don't know, construction outside. Construction, uh, cataclysm. They're tearing down the Uptown Project. The end, of, the, the end of everything that is good and righteous on this earth, except for the release of Double Feature. Fuck it. We are going to do this show. Um, we're doing two movies today. We're going to do two movies, but deal with four gentlemen. We're going to do uh, a kind of a... Pairs of comedians double feature has never touched before. Great. Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Doing good so far. Meet Frankenstein. Uh-huh. And Cheech and Chong's Up in Smoke. Now, we have seen Frankenstein on the show before. Yes, we have. And he, uh, was, uh, he was a little younger. And we've also seen uh, Cheech Marin That's on true. every other episode uh-huh. of Double Feature. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to spoil these two movies. And it goes without saying that... All right, we're going to talk about the content of the movie, so we're going to spoil the things we talk about. Right. I would say, on the usual spoiler radar, that these are relatively low. I'm usually the one that will say X film is spoilable when you say they have a low spoilability sure, rating. Sure, These two films, I would say, are almost unspoilable, aside from maybe the very ending of uh, Abbott and Costello. Yeah, I would agree with that. So don't accidentally chapter and then rewind. But you can use the chapters to just skip immediately over to uh, Cheech and Chong's film, Up in Smoke, if you haven't seen Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Uh, or you could skip to the end of the show, because some people just like to do that. Yeah. And they want to spoil the uh, the next week for themselves <laughs> right. and find out early. They're skipping to the last page here, man. So Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Well, there's a... so you would so you would expect. Well, so there's that first. Can we just talk about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, where is Frankenstein in this movie? There are many Frankenstein figures, uh-huh. um, characters who uh, use mad scientist techniques and electric orbs to do science, including Dracula, apparently. Right, but there is there is no actual Frankenstein, and I proposed. That maybe the title of the film came not from Abbott and Costello actually becoming acquainted with Dr. Frankenstein, right. but instead some Hollywood CEO going, what we need is a film that's Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, they've had uh, plenty of Abbott and Costello films up mm-hmm. to this point. This is by right. no means, when we talk about Up in Smoke, we'll be talking about their, their first film debut. Right. Uh, that is not the case with no. Abbott and Costello. They've they have around. a ton of movies, a ton of these. And I want to talk about them, but first I want to get to the insane names that show up at the beginning of this film. Okay. The film stars Bella Lugosi and Lon Chaney. Right. Really? It yeah. really stars them? Real, real. They're really going to be in the movie. Yeah, it really stars Bella Lugosi, unlike Ed Wood. Sure, um, yeah. Real Bella Lugosi, not fake Bella and Lugosi. And Lon Chaney Jr. There is, notably... No, Boris Karloff. What the fuck, Boris Karloff? From what I've read, Mm -hmm. uh, Boris Karloff was kind of um, pretty confident in himself as a Hollywood star, as a major name, as a serious actor. Oh, him and Lugosi both were... uh, Yeah. And uh, I feel like Boris Karloff probably didn't want to reprise his role as Frankenstein's monster or the mummy, Yeah, uh, which would have also been a fine reprisal. Uh, Because he was probably off doing uh, what he considered to be far more important, new, groundbreaking work, like uh, Isle of the Dead or whatever the hell that was called. He uh, he did flat out refuse to do this role. I'm not even remotely he, surprised. I think he hates this movie. I think <laughs> I think this is his least favorite. Yeah, right. You know, he wouldn't see the movie when it came out. He wow. wanted nothing to do with it. Although he did appear in the press photos, so I don't know. Yeah, it was this kind of gimmicky. Boris Karloff buying a movie ticket to go see this film is very, odd. yeah, very cheeky advertising. I don't know if Universal just had him like under contract. Probably. Or if it was this sort of deal, hey, stand here with a picture of a ticket in your hand and we'll give you a hundred billion 1930s dollars. Right. 40s dollars? 30s dollars? 30s, 40s. It's all about the same dollars. Karloff would want his money in 1920s dollars, I uh, yeah. believe. 
So this becomes the strange marriage of some of these universal films. Right. Which are akin, you know, on the show, the only thing we've ever really talked about, we've talked about two things. Okay. That might be similar in the vein of all of this universal lot. We own the content to all these things. We can do whatever the fuck we want. Sure. Uh, Blasphemy. But (laughs) we've, we had Freddy versus Jason. We did. Which is the opposite. That's two different studios own two different properties and they fight for... 13 years trying to get the the properties right. to come together whereas universal just they own all the monsters they just do whatever the fuck they want with the monsters they apparently own boris karloff on mm-hmm. his uh weekends right uh the other thing that we've seen or that we at least talked about is when you talked about kaiju yes so it's been a little while and we haven't gotten back to kaiju the way we totally said we would and a- we apologies. totally will sometimes it's gonna happen but uh, give me a little bit of a refresher. Now, do you see any of that kaiju stuff here as far as... It's so... It's it's very clear, aside from the fact that they fit in rooms. Right. Because um, the thing with, with kaiju, with the old Japanese Godzilla, Gojira monster right. films, is that studios made Mothra, they made Gojira, they made Rodan, they made all these films, and then they kind of just, you know, realized, well, we have a ton of giant monsters, and the best way to sell tickets is just going to be to combine... I guess the monsters collective fan base or right. fans of big monsters sure. and have them uh, punch each other's lights out instead of continuing to destroy poor Osaka castle. I think what studios have found though, is that the fan bases for all these things are actually just the same people. Right. But <laughs> so, then they cut down on production costs, having to make sequels for various films. And instead they just make Freddy versus Jason. And that counts as a sequel for both. Well, but that's the thing, right? Are they cutting down on production values or are they cutting their, you know, Harry Potter takes its last film, chops it in half, makes twice as much money. Mm-hmm. Universal takes two films, combines them in one, maybe makes half as much money. You know, I don't know. I, I, I think the longevity of Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein probably serves its purpose. I know that it was on the I Check Movies top number of something list. The best thing about this movie, before <laughs> we even get to Abbott and Costello, because that's also the best thing about right. this movie. But it is itself a universal monster movie. It's true. You know, when we did Young Frankenstein, that was haha Frankenstein. Right. right. It wasn't a Frankenstein movie to be considered in the canon. Sure. Although it went through pains to kind of talk about that canon and spin different things off. And, and look like it. Yeah, right, right. And we we uh, talked about that, too, about how it committed to the old black and white mm-hmm. and all of these different ideas. But this is universal making really one of the last of their monster movies. They found a new angle to kind of, all right, let's inject comedians here. But the comedians aren't really, it's not a spoof of those right. movies. No. It fucking stars <laughs> Lon Chaney and Bela Lugosi. I mean, it's a universal monster movie. In fact, I think it was one of the the last movies where any of these classic actors or that classic monster era where any of that appeared. Mm-hmm. It was kind of... um at the time, I think it was this genre fizzling out and them not really knowing what else to do with it. But I look back at it now, and this movie is going out with the bang. Yeah, this that's is, kind of uh, what it feels like. It feels like they, they've they almost been building up to this point, or right. at least they figured out what they could have built up to. Now, what I was prepared for uh-huh. was more along the lines of, say, the Marx Brothers show we did yeah. with Chaplin. What was that show? Uh, what, that was when we did The Great Dictator and A Night in Casablanca. Yeah, exactly. And um, those were, you know, comedians double features never covered sure. before. Also today, comedians double features never really covered before. And, you know, you, you talk about Abbott and Costello, and for some reason in my head, I lump them in with, you know, the Marx sure. Brothers. Um, comedians who, obviously, you don't see a lot of them anymore today, but they had huge eras. Right. But Abbott and Costello are very, very different from any oh, of these yeah. other comedian pairs, comedian duos. Yeah, well, the thing with Abbott and Costello is that they, they follow very strictly mm-hmm. what has become taken for granted as the straight man, funny guy sure, duo. Yeah. And I had no idea going in that Bud Abbott was so much the straight man that he almost just blends in to the actual ideology of the film. Yeah, right. I mean, he's not as he's not as dire and, and heavy as some of the other actors. Uh, that we see in this particular film. Looking at Cheney here. Looking <laughs> at Cheney. But he he's very much just a solid male lead actor. And then we have Lou Costello, who is the 100% comedy aspect. Right. 
And, I mean, he could do the whole scene by himself. He doesn't need Bud Abbott to play off of. It just makes it stronger when sure. Abbott's there to be pissed off at all the right. silliness and goofiness that Costello's pulling. Well, and later after the duo kind of split up, uh, it's strange that, you know, to, to keep going back to the Cheech and Chong stuff, because mm-hmm. that we saw that there where the duo kind of sure. split. But Costello went on to do some more movie stuff even after, you know, separating from that team. You know, when a lot of people think Abbott and Costello, they probably think the who's on first routine, yeah. right? Uh, which I thought almost everyone was familiar with. But a mutual acquaintance of ours, who I will not call out on the air, actually had no idea what that was. Huh. And I had a little difficulty explaining it to her. I, I don't even, I just went to YouTube. Wow. I just said, let's listen to the, the radio broadcast because wow. I didn't know how else... How do you miss out on an icon like that? Who's right? on first is one of those things that I I heard as a kid. Yeah, and I just I mean I didn't hear it on the radio as a kid, but I I was my my I think my mom told me about it or something. How do you go through life not knowing? That's like not knowing you can sit and standing at all times. Yeah. And one day someone's like, "Oh, sit down. Wait, what? Sit where? Oh, that's what all these chairs are for." How huh. do you not know about who's on first? Yeah. Everybody has not only uh, heard of who's on first, but probably done some variation of it, even if by accident in yep. their own life. Yep. And seen some kind of spinoff, some sort of uh, take on that that routine. And so now that we've insulted the percentage of podmanity that doesn't know who's on first is, <laughs> do you want to tell them what it is, or are you just going to do the no, point that. to Google I'm gonna, thing? I'm going to give them credit, and if they don't know what it is, I think that may be uh, one of the, the very few times they are deserving of just being completely mocked. Unless they're, you know, they listen overseas or something. If you live in some country I've never heard of and you haven't heard of who's on first, I'm wrong in that situation and you are correct. But Google uh, has yeah, Google the anyways. Google anyways. Uh, but I don't think of them so much as who's on first as I think that classic straight man idea. Yeah. Really the ultimate straight man. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and credit needs to be given to Abbott too because it's then his job one, to do this thing that I don't even think all the actors in this movie can successfully do, where they're in a scene with Costello and they have to refrain from giggling the right. entire time, which can't, well, be, can't be easy. And the other thing that I think must be so difficult working off Lou Costello is being able to know what to play off of, right. what to know and see him doing, and then what to kind of turn a blind eye. That's not actually happening. That's... Yeah. A little bit too much outside of the realm of this film. Right. That's funny for the audience, but me as a character, I don't see you doing that. Yeah. There's scenes where he looks at the camera, addresses the audience, and Abbott's in the room, and he kind of just has to pretend he doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. Lou kind of does the, uh, so there's that kind of face. Exactly. sort of gesture. That just happens. Uh, Yeah. And you just say, you know, Abbott has to completely overlook that. But the other thing Abbott has to do is blend into each movie. Right. So he is the one doing the, you know, I don't want to say the legitimate acting job, Mm -hmm. but. But that's what he's he's doing. He's being an actor within the film. (laughs) Sure. And Costello is the person who's introduced as Costello in each of these, (laughs) each of these movies. Well, to be honest, I had never really seen Abbott and Costello. I didn't really know much about them. Sure. And when the film opens, we get obviously one of the duo. Right. Who was Costello right. running around this mailroom. And then his angry boss, right. who I figured that's Costello's angry boss. Sure. I'm sitting here waiting for Bud Abbott's big appearance. Right. Uh, similar to back when we did Night in Casablanca. Exactly where what you I have, was thinking. Okay, well, these guys are the Marx Brothers, but aren't they supposed to be... Th- oh, that yeah. guy is a, <laughs> definitely a Marx Brother. Yep, there's the third one. Their body of of film is really far more in our territory than a lot of these other comedians. I'm a little surprised we've never covered anything. I mean, even uh, even to kind of reference their work before, mm-hmm. they did five or six of these meets films. So you know, working with Universal, they did an Invisible Man film, right? Okay. Uh, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello meet the Invisible Man, meet the Mummy, meet Jekyll and Hyde, meet a Brooklyn Gorilla. They did. They, no, I think you're thinking of somebody else. They uh, they did a ghost thing and a mystery, and they play in a lot of the spooky sort of Vincent sure. Price, House of Wax uh-huh. kind of territory. William Castle. Roger Rhodes. Corman is another name yeah. that comes to mind. <laughs> uh, all of that stuff, you know, and they have a ton of these movies. They even went to Mars at some point. Or, no, they didn't. Or uh, Venus, I think. Well, they didn't, but their film says that they did. Did they meet Venus? Bud Abbott and Lou Costello go to Mars, no joke. They um they both did burlesque before they teamed up, which huh. is another interesting thing that 
disappeared for, oh, I don't know, 80 years and has made a recent resurgence. Yeah. I saw a burlesque thing the other day. I don't know if you've ever been to burlesque. I don't think I have. Yeah. So, I mean, it's... um. It's some kind of. It reminds me of vaudeville a little bit. Yeah, it's all. It's a little bit of that stage show thing. It's a little bit of striptease. Uh huh. There was a part of me that rejected it for a long time because it's too coy. Yeah, it's striptease, but it's not really naked. It's pretty naked, right? With very minimal worst effort. Worst case could scenario. Become, <laughs> yeah, it's worst case scenario. You're not naked, naked. Very little effort it would take to be completely naked, and uh, mere decision not to. There's something cool about that too, right? The um the thing I saw, uh, I guess it was a couple months ago now. It was something called cult fiction in uh, Chicago here. Cult fiction. Yeah. um, A couple friends of mine run it. And it's a bunch of writers who get together, you know, every couple months or every month or whatever and workshop these little stories. And then they will, um, they'll get together at these readings and kind of do public readings of the short stories. Sure. And they're usually horror themed or, you know, they have some kind of horror idea. But anyways, there was a girl who did a bit of a strip tease in, uh, she had kind of like a horror wolf theme. Okay. And she did it to Duran Duran's Hungry Like the Wolf. Did you have pasties? She did have pasties. I hate but pasties. I know. I know pasties, pasties are the are, weirdest see, thing. See, this is what I'm talking about. I know. So it's completely awesome, totally hip. The fact that it was at a fucking, I want to say a poetry reading, but you know, a short story reading. Sure. At some bar somewhere or something. Art and burlesque. It sh- It seems like this is not the place you would find naked people. Right. But the fact that you're finding people that are almost naked, I both adore and hate it. At naked the same in public. Time. Naked in public. Uh, but, you know, back when Abbott and Costello were doing it, it, it was far more circus than that. It right. was far more carnage sure. sideshow. And that makes it really, really fucking hip. Also, Costello used to do this routine with his wife where he would be the straight man. Lou would play the straight man, and his wife was the crazy person. That's bizarre. Yeah, and so after meeting Abbott, there was kind of a decision that was made to go off and pursue that as a career. But, God, I wonder if any of that exists anywhere. I would love to see him. I want to say his wife's name is Betty. Him and Betty do a routine. Ridiculous. Now, while I know the comedians are our focus today, can we take a second to talk about Lon Chaney? Yeah, we, we should do that. I cannot believe how serious and heavy... Lon Chaney is in this movie. Yeah. You know, the nature of Karloff and uh, Lugosi fighting all the time sure. is that there are two different camps of people. One think one is the serious, legitimate actor who really should have gotten all the dark, deep roles. Sure. And the other being a, a fan of that actor thinking he is the better of the two men. Mm-hmm. But I'm just of the persuasion that Lon Chaney is where you go for, yeah. here's these two kids squabbling over here while someone is doing legitimate work right. over on the other side. Of course, all three of them are amazing to watch. They're yeah, I would definitely everything. say that uh, the answer is whatever you decide. There is no wrong answer. There is no wrong situation. answer. You are correct. I think the wrong answer is assuming that there's only one. Well, in this movie, there's clearly one. That's true. And so while that's not true of their entire careers, mm-hmm. here I cannot believe how heavy Lon Chaney is. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's surreal. It's seeing him in scenes, especially with Costello, right? It's like watching some kind of, like watching a a YouTube mashup. You can't possibly (laughs) believe that these two things are really going on at the same time. Someone has actually just taken scenes from Tank Girl and spliced them into scenes of Schindler's List. Mm -hmm. These performances weren't in the same room. They're not across from each other. I just, uh, there was a video that went around a couple years ago of... Jack Bauer interrogating Santa Claus. It reminds me of something like that. Although I think in that particular video, the people who made it filmed the Santa Claus stuff. But you know what I mean. It's just completely these two things taken out of context, or at least one thing, and put together. And seeing him act in the same scene as a infamous comedy duo. Right. And still be heavy and completely serious. It's more than just serious. You almost, if you're just looking at his side of the frame, you're really invested in this story. Right. It gets back to being, sure. I'm a legitimate monster movie now. What's going to happen at the end? Where is this story going? Right. Feeling for our hero. He's the tragic figure. That's true. In this movie. And he's really no less tragic here than he is uh, anywhere else yeah. he's acted. Well, except for the special effects magic. The special effects magic is, I would say, equally tragic in all yeah. of the Wolfman <laughs> films. But no less tragic here. Yeah, I would say that, I would say that it's actually trumped. In tragedy. That's true. That's true. Uh, by the uh, what is the it? animated what? bat? Is that what you're yeah, going for? Yeah, I don't for? know what you oh, even call God. that. The bat transformation. Now, okay, 
people are going to give us shit. I know this because they're going to say, well, what do you expect them to do? Dirk, dirk, it was way back then. They didn't have special effects. The answer, honestly, the fucking answer, puff of smoke. A missed opportunity. But there is the bit of animation in the beginning that yeah. uh, serves to tie the whole thing together a little bit. <laughs> if you want. <laughs> yeah, maybe it doesn't. Maybe I'm just giving it an excuse. Puff of smoke was too expensive. Not funny enough, I think, is the ultimate answer. But there's a later puff of smoke in the film that is uh, probably equally as expensive and funnier. Don't spoil the ending. I'm getting there. Fair enough. So, monster film as much as uh, a comedy, right? But I think that's the most obvious in the ending. That's the part where I'm really... I mean, we could hypothesize all day about, oh, when this movie came out, when people saw it, did they view it as this or they view it as this? The time when I'm honestly viewing it as one of the most tense and effective classic monster movies... Uh, And, you know, I'm a pretty big fan of these things. I haven't seen all of them by any stretch of the imagination. We've never put them on the show. Uh But I try and engross myself. I try and play along as much as I can when I see them. Because I find that's when you enjoy them the most. Yeah, A lot of people enjoy them in an ironic sense. And clearly they do have, especially with the Wolfman, a (laughs) lot of funny going on. But if I can try and put myself in that world and really just... Get in the mindset of the people who may have been watching the movie at the time. For the first time. Yeah, and just become engrossed in the story. Try and feel for these ridiculous characters. I find that I enjoy them the most. I get, you know, I guess I get the most value out of them. But you don't even have to try at the end of this movie. Yeah. You really get, uh, you get both this great monster drama, the tension, the performance, Mm -hmm. but you also get the best of the epic side of things. You know, when they're doing the surgery scene and it gets interrupted, the movie, I mean, it puts down its its comedy utilities for just a moment to really amp up the theatrical stuff, the yeah. tension, the drama to it. They, uh, you know, they're being chased by Frankenstein's monster, sure. but they're not being chased in a Marx Brothers way or right. a Benny Hill way. They're not running in one door and then coming out another door. They're being chased in a, I mean, it's less funny even than a William Castle yeah. movie. It's a very, very serious uh moment for uh, you know a film with a comedy duo in the title but the thing that i love about that ending is they're going out of these rooms and they're trying to throw in a couple gags here and there sure but the gags also serve to be kind of moments from the shining right you know these same things that are they're equal parts terrifying and also oh shit we forgot that the door opens that direction right but they get it backed into a room at some point and i'm so caught up in this frankenstein's monster story that um that i forget you know they enter a room and dracula bursts through the door fighting the fucking wolfman right we're watching bella lugosi fight lon cheney with flower pots with flower pots so comedic elements yeah there but also we're watching dracula and the wolfman fight sure and uh and while we're running away from frankenstein's monster for a short movie that ends in a single fucking house this is so epic yeah this isn't you know high up crane shot span out look Mm -hmm. at all the set we have epic this is just we look at the fucking juggernauts in this film and monster mayhem they're fighting each other it's amazing but it's not the thing that i'm most floored by Uh uh-huh the thing that really got me uh it's so it's the it's the exclamation point it's the point where the film goes we know what we did and here's how we can prove that to you here's one more little gem that you might have thought we missed this is the Easter egg. This is the claw sure. coming out of the sand and grabbing the hockey mask. I mean, they get in the boat, and wow, look at this adventure we've had. Burn it the shit out of the monster. Couldn't, uh, really couldn't have gotten any more ridiculous than that. Q Vincent Price. <laughs> Q Vincent Price laughing maniacally yeah. as well, which, as I previously pointed out, is the best thing Vincent Price could ever do. Yeah. When he starts cackling maniacally, I mean, it makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. And teases a movie that... Uh, sort of didn't really exist anyways right we're uh we're gonna move to a different comedy duo and a completely different type of comedy duo this is no longer straight man funny man comedy duo this is this is this weird fusion of latino hippie comedy duo but what a lot of people don't realize about Cheech and chong is mm-hmm. that the characters they play in up and smoke are not the only characters they ever played. And sure. furthermore, not the first characters they ever played. So before Up in Smoke comes out in the 70s, Cheech and Chong are really well known as a recording comedy duo. Right. They released a self-titled Cheech and Chong record, LP, vinyl, if, sure. if, uh, if that's what you want to call it. 
back in, uh, I believe, the late 60s or right at the turn of that decade. Where they started doing stuff that was both comedy albums but music as well. Sure. It was a combination because Tommy Chong is a musician. He started off as a musician in Canada in a band, believe it or not, called Four Niggers and a Chink. That was the name of his his band. I wonder why that never really got off the ground. (laughs) Um, But then he got into improv comedy and that's where he met Cheech Marin. And they just started doing these comedy routines that they ended up recording on this album, this iconic first self-titled Cheech and Chong album. Right. And this is where a lot of their characters were born. The man who Tommy Chong plays Mm -hmm. and also Pedro Dupacus, which is Cheech's character. Uh, But they also did, there's this one thing, they're probably the most iconic thing they've ever done, Mm. which was called Dave. There was a few references to it in Up in Smoke, but it was this thing where they totally did it off the cuff. Mm. Uh, Cheech comes to the door, says, he's Dave, he's got the stuff, open the door, I think the cops saw me. Keeps knocking on the door, Tommy Chong's on the other side of the door, says, yo, who is it, man? That was a great Tommy Chong. Thank you. Please go on. And Cheech says, it's Dave, man. And they go on and it builds up. It gets kind of tense, at which point there's a pause. And then Tommy Chong says, Dave's not here. <laughs> so it's similar to the moment uh, from this film. Right. And except there's a parrot. Is there a parrot it's in the a original? Parrot. It's not a parrot. Uh, but it yeah. was actually just a gag that Tommy had played on Cheech. Beautiful. It was supposed to be a whole different thing, but that's kind of the dynamic they had is that the dynamic is almost instead of funny guy, straight guy, it's I can be funnier than you. Can you be funnier than me? Right. Yeah. And uh, that's I think I think that's why these two characters pitted together in what eventually became a drug duo. Yeah. Again, they weren't even a drug duo when they started. Their jokes weren't all about pot. They were about, you know, the hippie 60s love culture. And right. they were a very counterculture subversive act when they got started sure because drugs weren't something that people were talking about in the mainstream they were talking about in a popular style because again 60s 70s we've covered exploitation at nauseum we don't need to talk about how much drugs there were right, in yeah. film but cheech and chong were making a living doing it they were popularizing it they were talking i mean they were saying what their audience was thinking when their audience was afraid to say it. Yeah, a lot of people see their influence in, you know, when you talk about comedians that have um, a lot of drug material in sure. their acts. Uh, Mitch Hedburn or yeah. somebody like that, right? Mm-hmm. But I, you know, as you're describing them now, I think about, remember when we saw Penn and Teller get killed? Yeah. That kind of two comedians speaking their minds, subversive acts. You know, very punk rock about it, right. but also one upping each other a little bit. Yeah. Totally watching out for each other, yeah. but still one upping each yeah. other. It reminds me a lot of that, too. And I don't know if the, I, I doubt Cheech and Chong were a direct influence on Penn and Teller. It's highly unlikely. But Up in Smoke is the first time Cheech and Chong are on camera in front of, you know, they're not in front of an audience anymore. They're, there's a film, they've written the film, they incorporate their own characters their own kind of sketches, their own music. Right, yeah. And it turned into, I mean, it became a massive cult hit. That's no secret. Right. But it also, I feel like there's just this thing that they managed to capture with Up in Smoke. Mm -hmm. They were totally punk rock in what they were doing and how they were doing it, but they never meant to be rebels. Right. They never meant to be bad boys. They weren't trying to piss people off. They're certainly not activists. Yeah, they they're just, just two people, and the cops happen to show up all the yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. They're just they're just cruising. Mm-hmm. They're just kind of in the middle of a yeah. un, a, a series of unlikely occurrences that all happen to involve weed, and that's because they always smoke weed. Yeah, you know what embodies that really well is the song about being framed right yeah, at the beginning of the movie. Sure, you know to talk about some of that music they're doing. Finding themselves in the courtroom, the entire idea of that song is the audience identifying yeah. as them, as saying, I'm just sitting around, I'm minding my own business, yep. and all of a sudden, the law, and I've been framed. Yep, exactly. I'm just sitting around, I'm smoking weed, all of a sudden, the cops are yeah. pulling me over. Puffing on dog shit. My mama's talking to me, trying to tell me how to live. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the movie has a lot of that conversation for you. They go to a punk rock show at sure. the Roxy. Right. You know, so you get to see them up against uh, what the rest of punk rock culture sure. looks like. Well, the, I mean, other aspects of youth culture at the sure. time, right? You have the, you know, the straight up 
kind of Sex Pistols esque punk group. Yeah, there's also like pre New Wave wears sure. makeup with a dancing chick in the band group. Yes. I mean, they, they even kind of touch on the waning music scene when they do the uniforms. Yeah, right. You know that whole era of everybody wears sure. uniforms. That sure. was a, that was still when that was kind of a staple in you know Motown. Yeah, and that's why you know you have the the black exploitation character. Sure, kind of the bringing... genre that just kind of accidentally finds yeah. its way in here. Exactly. It seems like the genre that's slowly moving out. Right. You know they're they're getting rid of that not just in the uniforms but in the way they treat it in the movie. That's their their old friends, their old cast of characters that happen to be around. Right. Well, and it's just kind of this overall thing where the man keeps talking about it, where weed is popular now. Mm-hmm. There was a time when weed was was weird and maybe still a little uncomfortable when we did hairspray right yeah doing drugs oh we don't do drugs we just want to dance right but now everybody does drugs and it's driving the market up and even cops are doing drugs now except for sergeant Stadenko. sure too many people are smoking and it drives up the price is that yeah. how the supply market and works? demand or something like that scarcity in the market there you continue go. uh well it is the last bastion of free enterprise last vestige of vestige. free enterprise i believe yeah, uh, it's, it really doesn't get a whole lot better than that. That line is so stealth. Yeah, It just I love sneaks it. its way right fucking I love in there. It. If it wasn't clear enough how we're treating the police at yeah. this point, it's, uh, I mean, this is cinema's response to Reefer Madness, mm-hmm. right? Sure. You know, Reefer Madness being this cult film, you can, that's another thing to Google, I yeah. guess. That'll be our what to Google in this uh, sure. section of the movie. And one of those things in year 156 of Double Feature that will clearly get covered. But we've been trying to use cinema to deliver our morals yeah. and our values. Yeah. And so suddenly counterculture is saying, you know what? The underdogs can use this to sure. deliver morals and values, too. Why don't we just make a movie showing what it's really like to yeah. be like ourselves? Or at least how we feel like it is. You know, we yeah. we show our side of the story. Yeah. And we show characters like Sergeant Sudanko, the narc cop. Yeah. Who, again, he was a character on the first Cheech and Chong record. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, they have him played by Stacey Keach here, one of my favorite actors. He was in Mountain of the Cannibal God. Cool. Um, he was also in this TV show, this short-lived TV show uh, called Titus about Christopher oh, Titus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he's fantastic in that. But I love Stacey Keach, especially in this, where he keeps putting his dim-witted lieutenants in the back seat for sure. being sure. stupid and uh the whole time he's just got this warped idea of the dangers of marijuana and uh what's, what's it called fiber weed fiber weed and <laughs> tv's made out of weed yeah and these just the seeds of the end of our generation just this whole mixed up apocalyptic view on how marijuana is going to be the end of modern civilization i mean he is the reefer madness character yeah he's the crazy over the top if you smoke pot you will go on an acid trip right but i mean they're trying to sunset strip instead of in an office yeah so he's out there you know day in and day out trying to do this uh while cheech and chong's characters are they're just going on an adventure they're bumbling they're totally all right you know nothing really bad it's smoking the bandit again right the People are going to get all wet. That's mm-hmm. the worst thing that could possibly happen. Right. Racing your car really fat. Smoking the bandit was a fucking lie, by the yeah. way. <laughs> if you're smuggling things and you're running away from the cops, you're going to kill people driving that fast. Yeah. That was a fucking lie. Right. These people driving around in a van and getting high, we see the worst thing that could happen. You kill can a drop dog. a. I was going to say you could drop a joint in your crotch That's and true. then you're not paying attention to how right. you drive. That's really, I mean, sure. the, the worst danger. I guess I wouldn't advocate smoking pot and driving a motor right. vehicle. But they're also going on more adventures than people who sure. smoke pot typically go well, on. Well, but it's all by accident. They all stumble yeah, upon true. adventure. A uh, great example when the man is at the party at Tom Skerritt, the vet's house. Yeah. And he's at that party and he accidentally locks himself out and sure. spends the entirety of the raid trying sure. to get back into the house. Right. Completely not aware that yeah, everybody there has just gone to jail mm-hmm. for using drugs. And then they end up getting deported because not because the Latino character doesn't have a green card, but because the Canadian guy sure. didn't have a green card <laughs> right. and they get deported to Mexico. But I thought they had a really good plan, you know, uh, repo agents. I sure. mean, how good is that disguise? Yeah. That's one of those things where when it happens, you kind of sit and think, well, fuck, why don't I have a, 
a Repo Man Spare outfit repo that suit. I, yeah, not a genetic opera outfit, right. but a I will repossess your items. Sure. Again, not organs. <laughs> I'm going to take your shit back and I'm going to cash it out and we're going to use that to pay your bills. You delinquent asshole. I also like that they call the immigration office um, La Migra. Yeah. Uh, and the, you know, the scene with the nuns and yeah. stuff. They're, I don't know if I ever told you this. I was detained in customs once. Oh, my God. Yeah, did I this ever tell you about perfect, this? Were you smoking weed? You know, I mean, honestly, pretty short story. I was driving to Canada with my girlfriend at the time who had mace in her car. Okay. And they came and asked us a bunch of weird questions. And we said the week, nope, weekday or something like that. Sure. And uh, they, didn't, <laughs> they didn't like our story. And, and I you think didn't it was throw a, your joint into a station wagon full of nuns. First big mistake. Yeah, right. So they kind of impounded the car or whatever. They yeah, <laughs> kind, right. of. kind of. They sort of impounded they our kind ride of a little bit. Removed our doors. Well, we also got pulled over by a Mountie when we were in wow. Canada. So I have I have plenty of good Canada stories to flesh out the rest of Double Feature. Um, basically, they just disassembled the car. You know, the scene with the nuns where the doors are lit. That's that's what it was like. Huh. It was fucking awful. And then they, uh, and then they basically yelled at my girlfriend for having mace in her car, as if she was some conspirator trying to overthrow Canada. Wow! So this is the other thing we should mention: neither of us smoke weed. No, but still love this movie. Yeah, that's definitely something, if I may. Yeah, please. Fantastic. Well, the one thing that I also really love about Up and Smoke is that you don't have to be high to like it. Sure. You know what I mean? Something like a, a film like Dazed and Confused. Not a bad film. Totally understand and enjoy Dazed and Confused, but I feel like Dazed and Confused is the type of film that when you smoke weed becomes the funniest fucking movie ever made. <laughs> sure, right. Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. If you get super fucking stoned, the movie makes so much sense. You love it. Up in Smoke, you don't have to be high sure. to realize that it's hilarious because these characters are so over the top and so clear. You totally understand a character like the man, like Tommy Chong, the voice right. alone, right? Yeah. The kind of, you know, man, you just kind of, you got to do what you're doing, man. Right. That voice lets you know exactly who he is and why it's funny that he has a lady's shirt on. Right. The fact <laughs> right. that Cheech Marin plays the absolute stereotypical hustling lady killer hood, you get it. You don't need to be high to understand what these characters are representing, what's going on. Right. All the characters are so defined and so clear, and everything they're doing is, is it's funny in and of itself. It's not funny because you're high. Right. It's funny because it's just funny to see Tommy Chong have a cramp while another girl's describing an orgasm, sure. and then he gets out of a van and everybody cheers, because that's honestly what would happen. But he didn't even get laid. Well, yeah, and I mean, we managed to talk about all of that counterculture and that punk rock stuff, too. The movie's doing a lot of sharp things sure. uh, for a movie that is about stoners. Right. It's not relying on the sort of BYOB audience yeah, exactly. uh, idea. Right. Uh, we'll make most of a film and just go ahead and score some weed and smoke it and then watch our film, and we're sure you'll love it. We're sure yeah, you'll have a good time. Exactly. Another amazing thing that, um, as a person who's never... Have you ever had weed in your never. life? Never. Ever in my life. So we're both just on the big no drug, no substance kick here. Yeah, we're the straight guys in the in this in this uh, in this crazy drugged up world in duo. which we live in. In the global duo. Now, before people start wondering what our vices are, they uh -huh. should maybe answer their own question as to why we've been talking about nudity every single yeah. episode <laughs> of the entire year of Double Feature. Maybe it's all starting to come together for uh, Podmanity. Another thing I like as a person who is not currently uh, or previously high while watching this movie <laughs> is actually watching Cheech Marin, who we've seen on the show a ton. Oh, yeah. Cheech, I mean, you're talking about him doing a character in this movie. He really is doing a character. This is not who Cheech actually no, not is. not even a little bit. It's not one of those things where, oh, these guys are comedians because we like who their personalities are. Right. Cheech has done some, I mean, some really fine acting. He's done, uh, I think, honestly, his parts in Lost, yeah. in the TV show I, Lost. That's, honestly, that's where I go to, too, when I think of Cheech Marin as an actor. He's got some really great stuff in that. He really carries a lot of those scenes. I mean, it's, it's some incredible stuff. But we've also seen him in virtually every Robert Rodriguez yep. movie ever. You know, a bunch of the Spy Kids stuff, uh, two of the Mexico movies, uh, Machete, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, you know, no stranger to his acting. 
but his singing career, his yeah. songwriting career. His guitar playing, his air guitar career. Oh, well, you know, we actually watch him write the lyrics for Earache My Eye yeah, yeah. in the movie, which is, <laughs> I mean, just this fucking incredible in scene. It's this kind of further insight. If you liked it on the album yeah. and you go to see this movie, I can only imagine this is the best fucking thing ever. Oh, yeah, for you sure. You are seeing a prequel to the, uh, yeah. to the seeing, album that you're you You're like. seeing behind the music yeah, for Earache right, right. My Eye. And it's just it's just him walking around writing stupid lyrics yeah. on a notepad. And but then he totally doing knows doing the doing. guitar part with his mouth. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even if it is completely fictional, it does seem like you're getting some kind of behind the music. Yeah. There's two things about the song. I love Eric My Eye. I love I this. I love it too. I don't know why. Something I, about the lyrics and I it's think just the Eric whole thing. My Eye and Up in Smoke are my two favorite songs. Also, one of the three versions of Lowrider. Yes. That doesn't have lyrics. Oh my God. There's so many versions of. Well, they're not versions of Lowrider. Right. We're meant to believe they're other songs. Uh-huh. But come on. Time to find a new drum machine. I have a feeling the act that uh, that Chong's doing at the end where he's knocking over the drums, yeah. probably what the percussionist was actually doing as they were <laughs> writing a Glowrider and all of those the other songs that band wrote. Now, speaking of hilarious bands, uh-huh. I know that uh, we usually use uh, Jonathan Davis and The Corn uh-huh. to uh, hold up some Killapalooza jokes here on Double Feature. percent heavier. But I'm going to... Uh, there's also sprinkled throughout. I'm just gonna I'm gonna blow the joke. I'm blowing our cover right now. It's year four. I'm uh-huh. gonna let the listeners in on something. Scattered throughout the show, find them like Easter eggs. There are references to how fat the members of Corn have uh-huh. gotten, and they're just they're in random episodes, and they're <laughs> subtle, and no one knew about them until right now. So go back, listen to all the episodes except year one because that year sucked, and find all the Corn jokes. Anyways, my point was. On their third album, on uh, Follow the Leader, wow, there is... I really should have started as if I don't know what I'm talking about, right? Uh-huh. I think I've shown my hand here. I grew up in the 90s, people. Give me a break. There's a song about black orgasms on the end. So fast forward through that one. There's a lot of bagpipes. And then at the very end, they actually do earache my eye and Cheech sings. No way. So if you haven't heard this, I'll play it for you after the show. It's fucking amazing. That's it's awesome. It's so good. And he kind of changes up the lyrics a little bit. And it's just very grungy. The whole album kind of has this feel of, hey, we're in L.A. today. We're just going to pull in a guy from the Deftones and Ice Cube will come sing a song. And it's just a lot of like bullshit covers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the hidden track on the album. It's actually, I think it's them just hanging out and talking with Cheech for like, I don't know, 20 minutes. And then the song actually starts. But the other thing that uh, struck me about that song is that the moment when he's talking about, ha ha, I only know three chords. Yeah. And in the movie appears to be, what, the only guitar player, right? Yeah. Uh, there's a crazy guitar solo going on yeah. under that. <laughs> in fact, throughout the song, it's littered. You know, the, the beginning is very simple punk rock, yeah. right? That very simple Ramones, here's mm-hmm. a couple chords, we're going to make an awesome song out of how, how minimal, you right. know, I don't know, effort we're putting, sure. <laughs> we're putting into this. Simple, beautiful, speaks for itself. But then it just goes into nuts guitar solos for right. the end half of the song, <laughs> which happens to be the part where he's talking about, we don't know how to play music. Yeah. And to me, that feels like the whole end of the movie. You know, it's it's lining itself up for this kind of awkward little Miss Sunshine final event thing yeah. that's going to get all the pieces sure. are coming together. Right. The road trip's ending. Uh-huh. We're going to get to the battle. We're going to... It's Detroit Rock City is yeah. what's happening. The, the weed van is finally on fire and everybody at the Roxy is high. So all of the dangling plot threads have just been wound into this point, pulled to tension. We've hit the perfect formula for them to lose it's pitifully. It's as if somebody were pulling to... the strings of the plot threads. Are you expecting me to dub that joke in 20 minutes ago? <laughs> Pull the strings. Just don't start talking about snails and puppy dog tails, right, or I'm right. going to have to cut your mic. All right, beware. I'll take care. These are all just treats for people who don't use chapters and watch <laughs> the movies. What I'm getting at, though, is we have this great formula for failure. We have a hilarious failure coming our way. Yeah. And then, surprise, they're amazing. Yep. They're the most amazing band. It, this wasn't a movie about them trying to achieve anything. No, nope, there was be no this montage. Great band. It's just that other types of punk suck, and this type of punk is awesome. Yep. And, you know, there's pyrotechnics, and people are cheering, and they fuck... I, I assume they win. Do we find out if they win? It doesn't matter. I don't it even really remember, because in my matter. head, they win. It's think, obvious that I they win. I think they win because they finally got high, and they've been searching the entire film for just a fucking joint. If only they had known what they were driving. So that's really one of my favorite parts, is that yep. they are a phenomenal success at the end. And, I mean, what more do you want from, uh, you know, a lot of people... 
view this as a pop movie. You and sure. I view it as an 11 a.m. movie. Yeah. Because uh, while well, these days, especially with all the crap I'm doing, 11 a.m. isn't that early. I am nostalgic for the times when 11 a.m. was yeah. an early. You're a fucking rock star. You are showbiz. You wake up at what, three in the afternoon? Yeah, some days. Except on double feature days. Right. But if you're waking up ridiculously early in the morning, maybe that's our substitutes. Yeah. For the people high. who are high in the middle of the afternoon, it's, watching it's sleep this movie. deprivation. That's how we get to the place that uh, other people who just have to smoke weed get to. All right. Well, uh, Double Feature has this website. It's uh, doublefeatureshow.com. Good enough. What's the other thing? Oh, uh, we have an email. That's doublefeatureshow at gmail dot com. Uh, you can send us uh, snippets of Costello and his wife doing their thing. Interpret that sentence to mean whatever you want, and then send us a video of right. that very thing, or your reaction to the thought of that very thing. I would really, I hope that footage exists, but we're too lazy to do the search ourselves. So please do that. Send it to doublefeatureshow at gmail dot com. Awesome. Um, I'll make this short. Next time we're gonna do Gattaca and Reanimator. Watch more fucking film. Bye.